past year, Detroit celebrated 100 years of automotive history, but there are few visible signs of that history left. Dodge Main, Clark Street Assembly, and many other historic auto factories have been torn down, but one industrial giant in Dearborn still stands, the River Rouge. Model A's, Thunderbirds, and Mustangs have rolled off the assembly line, but the real legends of the Rouge are the men who have passed through its gates. Henry Ford, architect Albert Kahn, Mexican artist Diego Rivera, Walter Ruther made union history on a Rouge overpass. Joe Lewis and former Detroit Mayor Coleman Young worked here for a short time. While their exploits fill volumes of history books, tonight we will concentrate on the lives of ordinary workers who lived through extraordinary times. The workers of the Ford River Rouge plant. Simpletons, obedient simpletons. That's what they're looking for. And you see that exemplified in the Charlie Chaplin picture, where you see Charlie after eight hours on the assembly line. And both of his hands go through a jerky screw motion, because that's what he did all day. In 1923, Charlie Chaplin observed Henry Ford's modern assembly line in operation. 63,000 workers building the world's most popular car, the Model T. The assembly line changed history, and it changed the lives of the $5 a day workforce that so desperately wanted a job. Italians escaping fascism, Russians fleeing the czars, southern blacks seeking opportunity and equality, workers separated by language and culture, but united in the search for a better life for themselves and their families. For many, that search would lead them to the gates of the River Rouge plant. This is a story about those workers. We came over to Ellis Island. That was in 1910. My father was born in South Carolina. He came to Detroit, I guess, in 1921 it was. I was born in Ravenna, Italy. My father was born in Winton, North Carolina in 1906. My father was born in a small town in central Mexico. Well, he ended up in Detroit because they heard that he was hiring at Ford. And they were making good money in those days. The automobile industry was attracting all sorts of people. Anybody who, you know, people were looking for work. When it was built in the early 20s, the Rouge plant was the largest industrial complex in the world. It was the fulfillment of Henry Ford's dream, a symbol of prosperity for Detroit, the inspiration for Diego Rivera's murals at the Detroit Institute of Arts. The Rouge was called the Cathedral of Industry, and like a church, it embodied hope for thousands of workers, the hope for better wages and working conditions, hope for the future. Laborers came from around the country, from around the world, to find a job at the Rouge. The diversity of their backgrounds is represented on the walls of this courtyard. Their common experience is illustrated by the formidable power of the machines, the strain of their muscles, the look in their eyes. My father left Italy on the threat of death. And I was just past 13 years of age, approaching 14. I came to America with him. Like many Italian immigrants, Guillermo Boatina first worked the mines in Western Pennsylvania. 
but the promise of higher wages enticed him to move his family to Detroit in 1925. By that time, his oldest son, Pio, would have his name changed to assimilate into the school system. His Americanized name is Paul Bolton. Italian workers with large families, Polish workers with large families. Ford liked large families. Also, Ford expected this type of European worker to be subservient. Not to know the language meant that he wouldn't gab. He just work, work, work. Isadora Valley immigrated to America in search of work and a better life for his five children. We were happy. We were, we were amazed at the way people live in this country, you know. Uh, all the modern things that we didn't have, we, we didn't have initially in those days. Modern mass production was ushered in by Henry Ford at the Highland Park plant. Over 15 million Model Ts were built here during its 14 years of operation. History was changed by this assembly line and this car. But never one to dwell on the past, Henry Ford envisioned a factory that could produce every component of an automobile. That vision began to take shape in 1917. It would rank among the uh, seven wonders of the world, I suppose, in terms of industrial history. In 1918, the Rouge factory was used to build anti-submarine boats for the U.S. Navy. Two years later, two-and-a-half-year-old Henry Ford II flipped the switch to ignite the blast furnace. The world's largest foundry and power plant would follow. Actually, there's nothing really like it before or since. Uh, it was a facility that could take raw materials right off the boat and from the train load and produce a finished car at the other end of the process. And there's nothing really that's ever matched it in terms of its capacity to integrate virtually every step in the process of making a complex metal machine. The machine that defined the pioneering days of the auto industry was quickly becoming outdated. The uh, record sales year for the Model T was 1923, when uh, more than two million were sold. Uh, but it began to lose out competitively after that. In the spring of 1927, the last Model T rolled off the assembly line in Highland Park. Car production shifted to the Rouge, and a sea of men surrounded its gates on Miller Road, hoping to get hired. Among the hopeful, the son of a Scottish electrician. I tried to get a job at Rouge, and they, uh, what they did is uh, they used to line up like 2 o'clock in the morning, even in the wintertime, when the word went out that they were hiring, or perhaps there's a notice in the paper, and thousands of workers used to line up. But people were pretty desperate for jobs. Out in the parking lot on Miller Road, day after day, night after night, we had talked and talked, opened our hearts. I said, looking into each other's faces, had developed a feeling of comradeship, fraternity, unity. We, we thought we had some power. We, we didn't feel alone anymore. There were two employment lines at the Rouge, one for whites and one for blacks. When I got a job to Ford, I had to go through a bullpen like they have cattle. George Hicks's father moved his family from Valdalia, Georgia to find work at the Rouge. He left a railroad job. Many other families left the farm. By 1926, Ford employed 10,000 black workers, more than all the other car manufacturers put together. Ford's was good to the black people. Now it was hard, but the other place was worse. World War I veteran Willie Nelson left South Carolina in 1922. Blacks coming up from the South, uh, coming into the industrial North, looking for great opportunities uh, uh, for living, uh, seeked out the Ford Motor Company to be employed. In 1923, he came to Detroit and he did get the job at Ford Motor Company. And I think in three months' time, he went back to North Carolina and got my mother, and they married and came to Detroit. Aaron and Ruth James would move to Inkster, a community promoted and supported by Ford as an ideal place for African-American families to live. 
My mother said when they first came to Inkster, there were five black families. So they made the fifth black family when, when they came to Inkster mm -hmm. in 1925. This is the house where Naomi and her eight brothers and sisters grew up. She attended this Inkster school built by Henry Ford. Ford had said that he was going to build up Inkster, and he did. Built new homes. He put electricity in them. The NAACP and the Urban League praised Henry Ford's hiring policies. For its time, the Rouge plant was a model of integration, located in a city of segregation. Local residents used to brag, the sun will never set on a Negro in Dearborn. Well, at that particular time, the only thing you could do at Dearborn is to ride a streetcar and go through Dearborn to go to the Rouge plant. Uh, in Dearborn, there was no blacks living in Dearborn at that time. But in Detroit, blacks, Italians, Poles, Hungarians, Lithuanians, and Mexicans would help propel its population to a million and a half residents during the Roaring Twenties, the fourth largest city in the country. Detroit was a booming city. Anything you wanted in Detroit, you could find it. All the way from a preacher to a pimp, you could find that in Detroit. And people were finding jobs, homes, recreation, the good life. It was a time of unprecedented prosperity and unlimited opportunity. I recall in 27 and 28, and even in, in the first months of 1929, big continuous afternoon seminars advertised with headlines. They gave you the impression that in America, everybody can become rich. Anything seemed possible in Detroit. The magnitude of those possibilities seemed to be embodied by the sheer size of the Rouge. One writer called it the most significant public monument in America. When you worked the Ford Motor Company, that was just like king. I wore my badge to church almost. That badge was just like you that was something else to work for more to go. The event was as big as the plant that produced it. The Model A was the first car built at the Rouge. Its introduction to the public was a national celebration. The Model A introduction was a phenomenon that has not been seen in business before or since. And the plant was nearly as famous as the car. The Rouge was easily the most visited plant in the, in the world. If you came to America from Germany or Japan or elsewhere, you naturally wanted to see Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyon, but you also wanted to see the River Rouge plant. Visitors would also begin to flock to another Henry Ford creation. On October 21st, 1929, Greenfield Village was dedicated during an elaborate ceremony that included President Herbert Hoover and Thomas Edison. The dreams of one visionary man seemed to be limitless. But just a few short days later, the dreams of many would be shattered. Getting cold and colder. I got nowhere to go. Hunger made no distinction of nationality or, or color. Mm -hmm. He had a fight to eat. It took over a year for the stock market crash of 29 to fully hit Detroit. By 1931, the city was devastated. Auto production had dropped by two-thirds. 4,000 children a day were standing in bread lines. The few jobs left inside the Rouge were for sale. 
people that knew people in the Rouge were selling jobs. You'd go down there and pay him, I don't know, different prices, $25, $50. He would give you a letter, and the Rouge would honor it. Lord, have mercy. Hector Bowden went to a Ford dealer in a desperate search for work. In 1932, he actually plunked her down on the invitation of some salesman that if he plunked her down $300 on a model, on a Ford car, he'd have a job. He plunked her down $300, he worked a week or two, then he was left without a job and, a, and, a, and payments on the car. He lost the car. As the Depression worsened, two Detroit City College students, Walter and Victor Ruther, photographed the shacks, the slums, the misery of the unemployed. Henry Ford saw a different picture. Well, I think everybody's decided that they've got to go to work. And I think from now on, there's no one can stop this great country from going ahead. Henry Ford tried to deny the Great Depression at the beginning. He had the feeling that if we all just worked hard, uh, everything would turn out all right. The search for jobs went beyond the gates of the plant and ended up on the doorstep of the church. We had a priest who uh, was selling jobs at Ford's. Would you believe that? Nowhere was the relationship between religion and the Rouge more firmly established than with the black church. Rolling, I'm a rolling, Since 1836, Second Baptist Church has played a vital role in Detroit's black community. First, as a key stop on the Underground Railroad. Later, as a place where blacks could get help finding jobs. From 1910 to 1946, the Reverend Robert Bradby was the church pastor. Ford hired him to be the troubleshooter, and as such, he could recommend people that needed jobs. So every black man that wanted a job at Ford's had to go through Bradby. A similar relationship was forged between Ford and Father Everard Daniel of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. With Father Daniel, he was the one who taught them how to fill out an application if it was needed, how to dress, how to talk. Many of them who had come from the South had not had any education, you see. But those who had, well, they helped the others, you see. Lillian Southern's father, Charles Mims, left Shaw, Mississippi to look for an auto job in Detroit. He was a member of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church, and it was through Father Daniel's contact with Don Marshall, who was in the employment office at Ford at the time, who helped get him the job. Don Marshall was a black guy working in the employment office. He hired all the blacks. A black couldn't go to one of the white employees in the employment office. You had to go to Don Marshall. So he looked at me. I was only about, about five, 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 five and a half. He looked at me. He said, son, I don't have nothing for you. I only have the foundry. So I told him I needed a job. The hottest, toughest jobs at the Rouge plant were in the foundry. It is where most of the black and Mexican workers were concentrated. Workers said no matter what your skin color, the smoke and the soot would make everyone come out black at the end of the day. All of these ethnic groups didn't have any he heaven on earth in Ford plant. It was hell for the eight hours you worked, and maybe the heaven began to appear to you when you walked out the gate going home. My poor father, with all his skills, 
had to accept life and the conditions of, of life in the Ford Foundry. Ford had been looking for subservience, and he got it. He come from the Ukraine, and in the Ukraine, uh, the czars were, you know, terrible, and he, he didn't like it out there. Nobody liked it out there. You know, they just uh, drove the people into the ground. And he thought he'd come here, and he'd seen the same thing here, and he figured, good Lord, you know, something's got to change. We've got to do something to help people. Every worker that was unemployed felt like he was a communist because he was rebelling. I would say they were radicals. I mean, they, they believed, and my grandmother was... Um, what they call a fervente communista, a fervent communist, in terms of her beliefs. Sam and Hannah Bussell left Russia and came to America in 1910. Their grandchildren believe they left Minsk to escape the oppression of the Tsar. The Bussells raised three sons while living in Detroit, Ben, Harry, and George. It's pretty much agreed in the family that he was more idealistic of the three sons. He joined the Young Communist League with his parents' approval. His mother was happy to see him working out her ideals. Communists and socialists found an open ear among jobless and hungry workers. There was no escaping the harsh reality of the Depression. Even Henry Ford couldn't ignore it. With sales quickly evaporating, Ford stopped making Model A's in the summer of 1931. He loaned the city of Detroit $5 million and opened commissaries in Dearborn and Inkster. Each of us that were big enough to walk, we would walk down to the soup kitchen, we called it, and they would fill up our pots with soup and we'd bring it home, and that would add to our meal. The Ford Motor Company had a commissary, so they called me up and said, uh, Get yourself a wagon, come down here with your mother. We'll give you all the food you want, and when, you go, when we put you back to work, you t we'll take so much out of your pay. So I did that. Three-fourths of the Rouge workforce were without jobs during the winter of 1932. The same immigrants who had come to America with high expectations a decade earlier were despondent and angry. Those that had walked on Miller Road during those years, 25 and 26, looking for a job, now remembered that the answer to Henry Ford, that everybody that was laid off was, was lazy, required them to, 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 to present a petition to appear in March on Miller Road as testimony to the fact that they were willing to work. And they demanded work. Regretfully, they, 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 they went there to get a job, and instead of that, they got lead. On a cold March morning in 1932, an estimated 3,000 demonstrators gathered at the Fort Street Bridge, intent on marching to the employment office at Gate 3. Every nationality in the world that had came to Detroit was involved in that march. One of the hunger marchers, 16-year-old George Bussell. The way I understand it, um, that when they were lining the marchers up, that they wanted young men to come up in front. And George, being a young kid and probably not conceiving of how dangerous it could be, volunteered. Waiting for the marchers, 40 members of the Dearborn Police and Harry Bennett, the head of the Ford Service Department. The protest was met with tear gas, fire hoses, and bullets. It was a massacre, that all hell broke loose, and it was a massacre of innocent people who had no intention whatsoever of causing any violence. What did I think of it? I thought they were, well, they weren't human. They couldn't be human to shoot them, men, women, and children down like flies. The aftermath of the bloodshed, five dead, 20 injured. Among those killed, George Bussell. My father did remember um, that he came home. He hadn't known what had happened, and he came home and found his father crying. It was the first time he'd ever seen his father cry. Five days after the shooting, 
funeral procession headed down Woodward Avenue. 30,000 people gathered to express their sympathy and their outrage. That march was uh, a march that I have not seen anything like it before. Standing at the gravesite later that day, Sam and Hannah Bustle. She wanted them buried in Windermere Cemetery, and she's responsible for them being buried there so that they'd be within sight of the Rouge plant. While the city was in mourning, Wayne County Prosecutor Harry Toy arrested 60 marchers, shackling two of the wounded to their hospital beds. All this talk about foreign agitators came to nothing because it was local people, people of Detroit. Local 600 were born in blood. That day on Miller Road when blood was shed by both black and white, it carried over to the organizing drive at Ford. were Ana Cleto and Paula Rodriguez. Uh, my father was born in a small town in central Mexico, and my mother was from uh, a place called Silos. Like many migrant farm workers, Hector Rodriguez came to Detroit in 1925. He would join nearly 4,000 Mexican auto workers at the Rouge plant, by far the largest concentration of Hispanics in the industrial Midwest. They would create a community in southwest Detroit and try to assimilate their life and their culture to El Norte. I think my father was um, a personable individual because he, as, as I saw him in, in later years, he could make friends with anybody. Uh, and I think he knew a little bit of Italian, he knew a little bit of uh, almost any language, it seemed. And uh, he just seemed to be able to get along with people. Although he lived in what we would call the barrio, which was the Hispanic community at that time. When the Depression hit, the Mexican community was all but destroyed. In order to get Hispanics off relief, the city of Detroit paid the train fares for over a thousand families to return home. During the Depression in 1931, we were deported. But it, my parents were deported. And five of us children who were born here didn't have to go, but my parents didn't want to split up the family, so all of us went. While thousands of Mexicans were forced to flee the country, one prominent Mexican artist arrived. In 1932, Diego Rivera came to Detroit at the invitation of Dr. William Valentiner, the director of the Detroit Institute of Arts, and with the financial support of Edsel Ford. His commission was to transform the bare walls of the courtyard here into something that captured the industrial heart of the Motor City. Rivera's eye was immediately drawn to the massive Rouge complex. After touring the plant, Rivera said, in all the constructions of man's past, there is nothing to equal these. He was fascinated by the power and the strength and the design of the, the machines, as well as the rhythm and um, a sort of a tyrannous rhythm that's set up uh, between the worker and the machines. Etzel Ford and Rivera admired each other uh, because of their mutual interests in art and in um, engineering and design. Uh, Rivera was so taken by the, the whole Rouge complex in uh, Dearborn and, um, and Etzel Ford opened it up entirely for him. On July 25, 1932, 
the Mexican muralist who never drove a car began painting his impressions of the world's largest car production facility. Edsel Ford was a frequent observer, and so was Paul Bolton. His criticism of those Italian painters that paint the saints and saints made him a different kind of a painter. He wanted to be with people. There's one worker on the south wall that has a hat on uh, with the, the slogan, we want. And um, I think he left it ambiguous because uh, it would have said, we want beer. But I think uh, giving it a double interpretation, you know, that the workers want dignity, good working conditions, so forth and so on. Rivera had painted muscles on the faces and jaws and brows of the workers that he painted on the wall. There is a sense that the machines dominate them. And so he was, he was comparing these, these machines with um, the creative and destructive forces of the cosmos. There were great um, newspaper debates, pro and con, about um, the murals. Were they communist? Uh, were they sac sacrilegious? The nudes on the East Wall um, were offensive as well it, as just uh, the fact that industry had invaded the sacred grove of the museum. Um, how dare an artist uh, bring um, working class uh, people into the, the heart of the museum and uh, the city council uh, got very upset about the murals themselves and threatened to whitewash them and uh, finally uh, Etzel Ford said that the museum was accepting the murals and that ended the controversy. Rivera's murals gave the public a chance to look inside the working heart of the Rouge. The pace of production slowly picked up with the economy, and the sons of immigrant workers were being hired into the plant. Isadora Valley's son, Guido, was hired in 1936. I wanted a job at Ford where my dad worked, you know. So I got the job. Uh, what happened after that is I found out how tough it was to work at Ford in those days. I mean, it was tough. It was just like, it was just like being a slave. You had so much production to get every hour. You were one piece short on the first hour, you're three piece short on the third hour, and he would tell you how many pieces you've mixed, missed all day. Uh, if you do not get your production, I got a lot of niggas out there on Miller Road that's ready to take your job. You lost your manhood. You lost your dignity. You didn't have any. Nobody knew uh, what the guy's name was. So, you know, they'd say, hey, Pollock, or hey, uh, Hunky. You know, that was the lingo that the bosses used. They didn't want to call you by your names. They, they, they would be giving you dignity. You heard of Harry Bennett. You know of him. Harry Bennett was head of the Ford Service Department, the largest private security force in the world. Bennett's recruits came from local gangs and Michigan prisons. They call them plant protection men. And they would all rob. Fords had, usually they, they were the FBI, because that's the way they worked. And one thing about Harry Bennett, uh, he, he, he moved these guys around, you know. You might see a guy in there, you might say, oh, that guy looks like he might be a serviceman. You may see him two or three days, you don't see somebody else is in there. You, know, you never know who you were talking to, you know. The Ford whisper was the way workers communicated with each other. Talk was dangerous, especially if it was about a union. You lived in fear because of the rules that they, they, they didn't have. I wouldn't say rules. They made up the rules as they went along in those days. Paul Bolton says you can see the fear and the oppression experienced by Ford workers in the Rivera mural. Not one single smiling face is on the Rivera murals, but he has the presence of tall servicemen 
well dressed, with tie on, servicemen all over, surveying the scene. He knew. He knew. He identified. He felt for the workers. In 1937, successful sit-down strikes in Flint and Detroit would establish the United Auto Workers at GM and Chrysler. A victory rally in Cadillac Square, the largest in the city's history, demonstrated the strength of the union movement. Ford could not ignore those victories. Well, right after the 1937 sit-down strikes, Ford began to organize his own union. They had organized the Ford Brotherhood, the Liberty Legion, and uh, at that time, the foremen were going around and pinning the Ford Brotherhood, particularly the Ford Brotherhood Union, on, uh, on, uh, on the aprons of the workers and on the shirts. Here's the guy that's abusing them, and, they tell you he, and he's telling you join his organization. There's the foreman worrying them too. In Washington, the passage of the Wagner Act ensured the right of all workers to self-organize. Henry Ford did not back down. He said, labor organizers are the worst thing that ever struck the earth. We'll never recognize the UAW or any other union. Henry Ford sincerely felt, misguidedly of course, that uh, his workers didn't need a union. That their working conditions and their pay were such that uh, they had nothing to gain from the union. He was greatly out of step with the times. Ford had a unique approach in that unlike General Motors and Chrysler, he was prepared to use uh, illegal methods uh, and a heavy dose of violence to discourage people from identifying with the Union. On May 26, 1937, Walter Ruther, Richard Frankenstein, Richard Merriweather, and Ralph Dunham climbed the stairs leading to the overpass at Gate 4, intent on passing out Union literature. They were met by Angelo Caruso and a group of four thugs. The Battle of the Overpass was such a public event that so clearly demonstrated that Henry Ford was no longer uh, the kindly gentleman engineer that he had been presented to the public as for so many years, but that instead he was tolerating a degree of illegal violence uh, that the public wasn't previously aware of. And the Battle of the Overpass clearly demonstrated that something had gone quite wrong at the Ford Motor Company. God, my feet. Wow. In order to stop the steady march of worker solidarity, Ford attempted to create racial division. He tried to enlist the support of foundry workers like Willie Nelson. He himself was recruited back then, uh, I guess maybe 37, 38, to, to be one of the servicemen. Our union term, we used to call them goons, I guess they used to call them. But anyway, he turned that down because he didn't want a part of it. Donald Marshall appealed to religious leaders to fight the unions from the pulpit. The Reverend Robert Bradby of Second Baptist declared his support by saying, if Henry Ford hires one colored for every 10 whites, I am for him, first, last, and always. Bradby had to please his employer, and his employer did not want the union. But a former assistant pastor of Bradby's preached a different message. The Reverend Charles Hill left Second Baptist to become the head pastor at Hartford Avenue Baptist Church. The basement became a private meeting spot for union organizers. Reverend Hill opened the doors of the church during the week, during Sunday after service and whatnot. And but the Ford Motor Company had their spies there. You had Ford Motor Company guys sitting in cars 
taking license plates and names of those who were recognized, all of them who went in Reverend Hill's church. Ford spies and influence went beyond the pulpit of the black church. The priest says to me, I want to see you after the sermon. I said, okay. So after the sermon, he says to me, I understand that you're tied up with the uh, communists in trying to organize the Ford Motor Company. And I said, what are you talking about? Uh, how he knew, I don't know, but uh, they had their ways. And uh, I said to him, uh, look, let me tell you something. You're not part of the Ford Motor Company. I don't want you to be, stick your nose into our union activities, and we're not going to stick our nose in the church activities. You run your church, we're going to run our union. Labor Day, 1937. Workers triumphantly marched down Woodward Avenue for the first time in 20 years. GM and Chrysler workers openly displayed their freedom and pride. Ford workers marched in fear. And the Ford workers were not organized. And uh, I can recall we had a little Ford contingent there from the Rouge, but they had masks on to, uh, to hide their identity. Henry Ford didn't try to hide anti-Semitic feelings toward what he considered to be the Jewish communist conspiracy trying to destroy his company. On his 75th birthday, Ford accepted an award from a distant personal admirer, Adolf Hitler. Ford was foolish enough to accept it. People told him to reject it. He said, no, they want to give me this ribbon band and I'm going to keep it. The upshot was a uh, boycott of Ford products by Jews, the most complete ethnic boycott in the history of this country. Public opinion was slowly beginning to turn against one of the world's most admired men. The UAW put the full force of its organization into the Rouge. Political dissension inside the ranks of the Union slowed their progress, and so did the determination of Henry Ford. At the Ford Motor Company, Ford said he would shut the place down. He would move the place away. And the workers had to go on strike. April 1, 1941. Just after midnight, 50,000 workers walked off their jobs at the Rouge plant. The courts had ruled that sit-down strikes were illegal. So the UAW formulated a new strategy. Picket lines formed a human barricade around the plant to prevent cars, trucks, boats, and people from getting in. A union means united we stand, whether you're black, white, green, or red. That's the idea of a union. But the workers were not united. On the eve of the strike, it was estimated only one-fourth of the Rouge's black workers supported the UAW. Seizing upon this racial division, Ford used black servicemen to break up the picket line. Blacks had become suspicious of unions because they had, in the past, uh, discriminated against uh, black workers all over the industry. Ford also promised to pay foundry workers for their loyalty. Reverend Hill went up to the foundry gates over here the second day after the strike. And that day when Reverend Hill uh, spoke to him there for about an hour and a half to two hours, they began to come out. A few of them come out at first, and then some more would come out. And the, I, 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 Reverend Hill had told the white organizers at that time when they come out, embrace them, don't try to fight them, you know, and it did. George Hicks was one of the foundry workers stuck inside the Rouge when the strike began. I was in that plant, and my wife got angry with me because I didn't stand because most of the guys got enough money to buy my car. So I sneaked out the plant. I wasn't going to be hung up in there. For 11 bloody, tense days, Henry Ford resisted pressure from the government, the union, even his own son, Edsel, to settle. Henry Ford would listen to very few people, but he did respect his wife, Clara's judgment. And when she said that she would leave him if he did not sign an agreement with the union, he caved in. On April 11th, Henry Ford agreed to a National Labor Relations Board election. 
A month later, Rouge workers voted for UAW representation. Al Bardelli is the last living member of the union bargaining team. I thank everybody that was on that picket line in 1941. I happened to be a little drop in a barrel of water. We were in a celebrating mood. The union is here to help us, you know? Now maybe we can work like, like human beings instead of slaves. Thousands of miles away, Union activist Walter Dorash read about the UAW's victory in an Army barracks. April 1st, 1941, I was in the Army. I was drafted. Yeah, at that time, they weren't discharging the organizers. They were putting them in the Army. Before the year would end, thousands of Bruce workers would join Walter Dorash in the service. The same laborers who fought for freedom and opportunity inside the workplace would soon fight in a larger war. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. We came over Ellis Island uh, when I was about 10 months old. He wanted to come north to seek a better life for he and his family. For a youngster to get a job at uh, Ford's, well, hey, that was terrific. We used to drive down Metal Road and he'd point out, uh, this is the building I work in, this is the job I'm doing. I'm proud of the Ford Motor Company and I'm proud of the union. If we don't know the history, if we don't know where we have been, we don't know where we're going. The story of the Rouge can be paralleled in some ways to the story of Detroit. They were built in a time of limitless opportunity, but like most of the industrialized North, the plant and the city have seen better times. The Rouge at one point employed 100,000 workers. Now, the workforce is less than 15,000. Still, a rich, spirited history remains rooted in thousands of Detroit families to this day. Workers who would experience the promise and the pain of industrial America inside the gates of the Rouge. Mexican artist Diego Rivera was fascinated by America and one of its most monumental symbols. He said, here it is, the might, the power, the energy, the sadness, the glory, the youthfulness of our land. Ah! 